you have your Bibles this morning, turn us to Genesis 24. I hope you had the opportunity to look at this passage of Scripture. And I am going to endeavor this morning to get through six points with you in regards to this topic of dig me, date me, dump me, and our ideas in regards to relationships. I'm in the middle of this series at our home church, and it usually takes me about eight weeks to go through all of this. And we're going to do it in two days and two 35 or 40 minute sessions. Let me start by saying uh, a sincere thank you to the hospitality that my wife and I have both received while we've been here. I had the opportunity after chapel yesterday to speak in one of the business classes. I had a, just a great time in there. And then last evening, I had a chance to uh, head over to the guys' dorms, the guys that are around Merritt 109, and spend some time in Bible study together and uh, enjoyed that time very, very much. And I appreciate uh, those of uh, you that I've had the opportunity to, to meet and uh, I've really enjoyed my time here. We head back this afternoon to 20 degree weather in Philadelphia and I'm not looking forward to that. But uh, we want to make it back tonight to be with our own youth group uh, tonight for a study in his word tonight. So thank you so much. Genesis 24 is a beautiful narrative on the relationship that was built between Isaac and Rebekah. And in our culture, we're going to have a hard time really understanding this chapter. You know, the chapter, most people would look at and say it's really about an arranged marriage, but it's really not, not at all. And there are six principles that are here that uh, I want to give to you for you to consider. Again, as I said to you yesterday, I really have no intention to preach at you. That's not my style. I'd rather talk to you as an audience of one as you're growing in Christ and trying to, you know, navigate your way with the Lord's help into those things that he would have you to do as a young man or a young woman who loves Christ. And yesterday, my major point was simply that, you know, marriage is something that God ordained and the world has taken that and everything that leads up to it, and in my heart and in my mind at least, has destroyed it in so many different ways. And as you begin to consider, and some of you, it's too late. <laughs> maybe you want to reconsider, maybe not. Um, as you consider your relationships, as you would build them possibly here, um, or after college, or whenever that happens, I hope that you'll keep in mind Genesis 24. Because there are really six principles here that don't want you to miss. And I want you to tuck away. So if you're taking notes this morning, uh, you know, please jot these down and hopefully they'll be a help to you. Point number one, there is a point. There is a point. What I mean by that is there is a time to look for love. It's amazing to me today how often or how early relationships are starting. 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade of high school. Some of you went through this yourselves. And being involved in some sort of relationship. You may not have been dating, you know, officially by that kind of sense or the name of the word. But you were involved with a young man or involved with a young woman. There's a point. There is a time for love. What was happening in the story? Abraham was very old. We, we read that in the first few verses. And his wife, Sarah, had just died about three years earlier. Does anybody know how old Isaac was? You actually find it in, in uh, chapter 25. Anybody know how old Isaac was? He was 40 years of age. Now, I'm not saying wait till you're 40. That's not what I'm saying. All right? But there is a time for love. There is an appropriate point to begin to search for that person in your life. And in Abraham's mind, for his son Isaac, it reached that point. So the application here, young people, is very simple. And I'm going to fly through these, and I apologize for that. But I really want to get through all six this morning. And that is, you know, everything from your emotional maturity your physical maturity, 
your mental maturity, and certainly your spiritual maturity will determine that point for you. I probably shouldn't share this with you, but it's the truth. My wife and I got married before we graduated from college. I was so in love, and I was. But there were a million other factors that were involved in our decision to get married just before our senior year of college. And in 25 years of counseling young people, there's only one other couple that I recommended that they get married before they graduated from college. It's tough to do that. So I can't stand here and absolutely say one way or another, you know, what's the right time? Only you can determine that with God's help. In all of the things that you're uh, learning and developing here at school will determine those things. And I'll say this, just because you've entered college as maybe a freshman here does not mean that all of a sudden you're ready to start a relationship. I talk with many parents who try to encourage their students to, their, their children to get through high school, you know, without dating and those kinds of things. And then as soon as they get to college, it's like it's a free-for-all. I'm not sure that's good either. There is a point, point number one. Number two, there are people. There are people. As you begin to read down through this chapter, you find out that there were lots of people involved in this process. Isaac wasn't the only one. The thing that sticks out to me more than anything else, as you begin to read down the first seven, eight, nine, ten verses, as he goes to this trusted servant, we're going to come back to him in a minute, he goes to this trusted servant and wants this servant to go out and find a wife for his son. Now, in our day and age, that just boggles our mind. But in that culture, that was a coveted position for this servant to have. And Abraham was old. He was an old man. And he wanted this trusted servant, who I believe was Eliezer, to go out and find a wife for Isaac. And if you read down through the passage of Scripture, you saw that this, this servant was going... I can't do this. And he was looking for a way out. What happens, Abraham, if, if, if the lady will not come back with me? What do I do? And Abraham said, the Lord God of heaven, who has walked with me all these years, and has led my life all these years will lead you in your search for a wife. Young people, there are people involved, but the first person that's involved in your process is God. And how often we forget that simple point, that God must be involved in this process that you're going through in developing relationships to find the perfect helpmeet for you. God is trying to complete you as an individual with a bride or with a husband. If you had the opportunity, and some of you guys, Nate and... Joey and Britt and some of these guys know my wife really well. You would know that my wife completes me. And God wants your bride or your husband to complete you. God must be involved. You know, as you study down through the passage, you also see that there was a godly father of a son that was involved in the process. You also see there was a godly father of a daughter that was involved in the process. And you also see a very, very trusted servant that was involved in this process. And you know, there was a brother in there too, by the name of Laban. 
You know what happens or what I've seen? To be very honest with you, I talk with young people all over this nation. And you know what I find out? That we don't do what we talked about yesterday and allow the Spirit of God to transform our minds and the way we think about things. And instead, we actually conform ourselves, we fashion ourselves alike, like this world, in the way we think about developing relationships. And you know what happens? The first thing that happens, guys, you fall in love. And love is blind. And you go down hard. And you're in love. And you know what? You bring this young lady home. And your parents go, uh, and you know what you do? You throw your parents out of the process because you think you know better. Just this past semester, not here, another college, another young man that I know, dating a lady for three or four years, was on his way to get engaged. And the entire time, everyone, his mother, his father, his brothers, my, me, my wife, and everybody in between was saying, don't do this. And praise God for a young man who finally came around and listened to his parents. But so often what I find is that you throw your parents out of the most important process of your entire life. Because your emotions kick in and you think this thing that you're feeling is love when it really isn't. And young people, love is hard. I will tell you that right now. You realize, and we're going to come back to this, that the majority of marriages today, and it's no different, hear me, it's no different between the unsaved and the saved are ending in divorce. Buddies of mine from college didn't make it through five years of marriage and they were divorced. Good, godly guys didn't make it. I'm coming up this August, 25 years. And the Lord tarries, I'm going to get another 25 years if my health lasts that long. Right? But we end up throwing out our parents instead of engaging them in the process. I trust, I beg you, that you have the right kind of relationship with your mother and your father whereby you can talk to them about anything, but especially this choice of a husband or a wife. Please, allow your parents who know you the best to help you through that process. There was a godly father of a son and a godly father of a, of a, of a daughter that was involved in this process. I can't make absolute statements, but let me just give you a warning. If you have a father and you have a mother who love Christ, and you have a bride and that mother and that father love Christ, and both of those couples do not want you to be married to that bride, I would encourage you not to do that. There is a situation in our own church of a couple who went against both sets of parents and got married, and you know what? It's worked out, it's worked out splendidly. But that's one in a million. There's a principle in the Word of God, and it is that of authority. And whenever you go against the authority of Scripture, you're going to lose. And your parents have been placed in a position of authority over you. And you need to allow them to be involved in the process. Eliezer was in this process as well. And I'll just comment on that. Other people need to be involved in your process too. Last night, 
Nate's, Nate Paree, many of you know Nate's senior, he's getting married sometime as soon as he gets a job, okay? Had a chance to go out with Anna last night, spend some time together, to talk with them and just, just fellowship. There are people that you know that grew up around you, your parents' best friends, you know, whoever they are. Those people need to be involved in the process too. When you study out Eliezer, if you study out what his job was and, 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 and all of the things that he was doing for Abraham, he was like a pastor. He was an elder. He was an older man. Who are these people in your life? Those that you run to for counsel. They need to be involved in this process. I, te I tease all the teens that I have, you know, you start dating somebody. I got to meet them. They ain't getting married till I meet them. You know, I want to meet these people. It's important to me. Your parents have, have poured their lives, and you will never understand this until you have your own children, and whatever. So I can't explain it to you. And I didn't get it either until I had a 19-year-old son. I get it now. Okay? It takes a while. They've poured their lives into you. And so have other people around you. I love my kids. I love my teens that I minister. I love them. And I want to see them as happy as I am in their walk with Christ and with their bride. There are people that must be involved in this process. Can I encourage you not to throw your parents out, but to give them the opportunity to be involved. Third, there's a place. If you studied this out, you looked at it, you know that Abraham sent Eliezer out of the land where they lived to go look for his bride. He did not want this servant to choose a bride from among the Canaanites, which was a land in which he dwelled, because they were a pagan people. They were sliding down a road of debauchery, and he did not want them to be involved in his son's life in any way. You also see in the story, I think this is kind of neat, you know, Eliezer is a smart guy, and he went to where the women were. He went to the well. And he knew that the ladies would be coming out, the maidens, as they were called, would be coming out at nightfall, and he, they'd be coming out to the well there. You might meet your mate here. Where you go to church, where you go to college, those that you hang with, those are the places that you're going to meet your future mate. And Abraham was so concerned about this that he sent Eliezer off to a foreign land to find a bride. Why? Because Abraham did not want his son's wife to lead him away from God. He was not only, if you study the passage out, he was not only concerned about Abraham being led away, he was concerned about his grandchildren this was the line, right? And he did not want any corruption, if you will, in that line. And it's interesting what you read as you go on. And, and Eliezer says, uh, about the middle of the chapter, he says, I being in the way. There's a physical place. Yeah, you're going to meet your college you know, sweetheart, maybe here, or whatever. But there's a place internally as well. Think of all that Eliezer had done up to this point to prepare himself to the place where he could choose a bride. I being in the way. Think of all the things that he had done and how he had served and how he had prayed. And he got to the well and he said, Lord, you know, let the one be when I ask for a drink that not only does she give me a drink, but she comes and she feeds all of my camels as well. 
And you know that's a huge undertaking because it says in the earlier part of the verses, he took 10 camels. And all of the things that had happened, Eliezer was in the way. And he did not want to be, he did not want to choose a bride that was not absolutely perfect for Isaac. Studies show that 20% of people meet their spouses in college. The number is rapidly declining. Do you know where the number one place is that people meet their spouse? A bar. And you know what's sad? I actually read a study that wanted to indicate, I'm not sure if this is true, pray to God it's not, but the numbers are the same for Christians. That's unbelievable to me. There is a place. There is a place. Number four. There's a personality. There's a personality. I want to read to you Genesis 24, verse 15, down through verse 21. It says, it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born of Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with a pitcher upon her shoulder. And a damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled the pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, let me, I pray, give thee drink of water of thy pitcher. And she said, drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon his hand and gave him to drink. And when he had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water and drew for all of his camels. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. There is a personality. I won't spend a lot of time here. But gentlemen, did you know what, uh, did, you under, did you pick up what the Lord said about Rebecca? She was fair. That's not what it says. She was very fair. She was a beautiful woman. You've heard the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? How many of you have seen the little animated movie, Beauty and the Beast? Okay. Here's an ugly guy who's going to stay ugly for the rest of his life until he finds somebody that will love him for who he is on the inside. You obviously need to be attracted to your husband or to your wife. My wife is beautiful. She is the most beautiful woman that I know. Nate, I hope, feels the exact same way about Anna. And when you meet that lady, the same thing will happen to you. And you need to be attracted. Rebecca was fair. She was a beautiful woman. But you know what? More than anything else, and can I encourage you with this, especially you young ladies as you're looking for a husband. More than anything else in this passage of Scripture, the thing that sticks out to me about Rebecca was that she was kind. Here was a complete stranger who asked for a drink. And she said, I won't just give you a drink. I will give enough water to all of your camels so that they too can have something to drink. 
Rebecca is remarkable in her kindness. Have you ever been in a situation where you've maybe seen a couple in a restaurant and they're being unkind to each other? I would tell you that I believe, even though I do not, my wife actually challenged me on this point with my daughter just the other day, but I do not believe that there's any situation whereby we need to be unkind. We will disagree. We will not see things the same way, and you will understand that when you get married. Two wills, two emotions are being merged together into one. There's going to be disagreement. And there's going to be hard times, many of them. But there is never a point to be unkind. Rebecca is remarkable in her kindness. There's a guy that I've listened to, his name is Dr. Zacharias, who teaches a lot on marriage and those kinds of things, and I want to quote something that he said. And if you don't hear anything else that I've said this morning, I want you to hear this. Ladies, gentlemen, this is the moment of your life when he who is wooing you will be at his kindest. And if you don't see this kindness, watch out. Ladies, gentlemen, will swoop you off your feet. And at that moment of life, it is the time where he will be his kindness. Because he is trying to win something from you. And as your relationship develops, if you do not see kindness, I kindly say dump him as quickly as you possibly can. It is at that moment of life when he who is wooing you will be at his kindest. Number five. Wow. There is a purity. There is a purity. Verse 16 is a very interesting verse. It starts out in saying that the damsel was very fair to look upon. A virgin, neither had any man known her. Certainly young people today, I think the Bible is very, very clear that we should stay physically pure. And we must. And we must. But what's interesting in this verse is that you notice there is a bit of a separation. It says that she was a maid. And then it says that no man had lain with her. The second part is talking about that physical purity. Here was a young lady who knew, get this, that her body was the temple of the Spirit of God. And she was physically pure. And I trust that you will remain pure before the God of heaven and that you will save yourself for your husband or your wife. It is the greatest gift you will ever give. It's one of those firsts that we talked about yesterday. But as also part of this word, it says that she was a maid. And young people, what I take from that and the context there and something that I am beginning to study out in my own life uh, as I try to help young people, and that is this. She was emotionally pure. Many young people ask the question, How far can I go? 
It's the wrong question. It is the wrong question. The question is, how close can I stay to Christ? And I'm watching young people, my own young people, involve themselves to the point where they are emotionally unpure. It's why the scriptures say that when a man looketh on a woman has, and has lust in his heart, he's already committed adultery. There is biblical precedent here for the emotional side of love. And in the confines of marriage, this is why, this is what, God created a beautiful thing. And the emotions are part of that. And when you're able to let that all go within the confines of marriage, it is the most beautiful thing. It's not good for a man to touch a woman. There's a reason why that's there. And so many of our young people run off to Christian colleges thinking that they will be free from the temptations of sin in these areas and find out just the opposite. And among young Christian men and women, on this point, we are failing. I want to quote to you from an old preacher. His name is Clovis Chappelle. He wrote this when the turn of the centuries, when the modern dance was becoming very popular. I don't want you to think about this from the standpoint of modern dance, or he goes on and talks about Hollywood. This man wrote this probably some 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years ago. I want you to think about it instead of the media that's out there, the movies that are out there, the advertisements, the internet, and all that goes with it. Listen to what this man said. And I think you would agree with me, young people, if you've got a spiritual bone in your body, this world is not getting better. Listen to what this man said years and years and years ago. The tendency of the modern dance is to take the fine edge off the modesty of both young men and young women. A blacksmith can no more handle the trade, tools of his trade without hardening his hands than a girl can be clasped in the embrace of, of promiscuous men and still keep her sensitiveness to the questionable and to the unclean. When we consider, therefore, the thousands who are engaging night after night in the modern dances, our wonder is not that so many go wrong, but rather that so many hold their footing upon such slippery places. He talks about Hollywood. Take example, our stage folk. They are neither better nor worse to begin with than the average. They're just ordinary human beings. But they play at lovemaking so much that it loses its sacredness. Caresses become cheap and common things to be dispensed to almost any passerby. Such a girl, to use a figure from James Lane Allen, becomes like a bunch of grapes, a become a common path where everybody that passes takes a grape. He who takes does so without reverence and to his own impoverishment. In the golden coin of real and abiding affection, such spendthrifts, spendthrifts soon become utter bankrupts. Ladies, ladies, you are not a bunch of grapes over a common path for every young man who passes you by to take a piece of your heart. You are not. And I've met with too many young ladies who weep 
after they're married, who have given so much of themselves away, they have very little left for their husband. And I encourage you to stay physically and emotionally pure. Lastly, number six, we're out of time. There's a praying. There's a praying. In Genesis 24 and verse 63, it says, Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. Can't you see it? How many days was Isaac out in the field waiting? He knew that Eliezer was coming back sometime. And he knew that he was going to bring him his bride. What anticipation. I still remember the day my wife and I got married. I couldn't wait for the thing to get started. There were too many people there, and I knew it was going to take too long for us to get out of there. And I stood at the aisle, and I waited, I waited, I waited, I waited, and I waited, and I was, something happened with the music, something happened with the lights, something happened with something, I had to wait even longer, and I'm thinking, when are those doors going to open? When is this man going to bring his daughter down to me at the front of this church? And here was Isaac, out in the fields, walking the fields, says he was meditating. Gentlemen, ladies, what was he doing? He was praying for his bride. There's a praying. How many of you are really, before God, praying for that husband? Or that wife. He was out in this field. He didn't know when he was going to return. And don't you love Scripture and the pictures that it presents? Young people, Christ talks about us as his bride. He is that bridegroom that is coming for us. And it is a beautiful, sacred, holy thing. And that is the example that he gives for us, for us as we look for our husbands and our wives and our brides. That's what he gives us. And it is a beautiful, sacred, holy thing. In our culture, we've made it so cheap. And as I said before, God's not even part of this picture. But here was Isaac. He was meditating. And when Rebekah, verse 64, lifted up her eyes, when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said to the servant, What man is this that walketh in the fields to meet us? And the servant had said, it's my master. Young people, we can talk forever about marriage and romance and love and dating. But the question really is, are you a man and a woman of prayer that is deeply devoted to God so that he can reveal to you the one that he has. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the, com the complete canon of Scripture, for the simplicity of the Word of God, and the principles that we can find there to challenge us. Lord, be with each young person that's here. Would you help them in their walk with you that they might be devoted to you, that they can find that perfect mate that you have for them. That they will use the word of God as their guide. Watch over each one. Help them, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.